Hello, hi, welcome back to Little Guys, the show about little computers that are doing their best. And this time around, it <laughs> sure looks like we have a guy that's not so little. Uh, but the truth is, and you could probably suss this out just from looking at it, uh, most of this is not the guy. This here is the guy. The rest of this is a PBX, and boy howdy, I'm uh, not going to get into a, a long crash course on PBXs because uh, I already shot this video once and spent, as it turned out, like 40 minutes talking about that completely by accident, and I don't want to inflict that on you again. I used to be really into telephones, but I'm recovering now. Um, it turns out they don't do anything that I actually want to do, but I did used to be into them and I used to collect PBXs. I owned uh, three or four at one point, uh, all pretty big, and they have a lot of common elements. So once you know one, you kind of know most of them and you can kind of pick out how things fit together. I'm just going to give you the, <laughs> the very, very basics on what this does. And then we'll start looking at the computer, which is of course, mostly what we're here for. It's certainly mostly what I'm here for. This particular machine, for instance, is an Intertel. Uh, what is the model number? Access. A-X-X-E-S-S. -S. That's not how you spell that. Now, I don't know if there's more of a model number than that. That sure feels like it should be a family of devices, and I get the impression that it is. And indeed, this seems to be cobbled together out of components that were designed in many different eras. So in the briefest possible terms, a PBX is a device that allows you uh, to order several phone lines from the phone company, each of which allows you to place one phone call, and then fan those lines out to many, many, many users, and also allow them to call each other without using the lines directly. It is uh, a little tiny phone company branch office that lives in your place of business or your home if you're a gigantic nerd like I used to be. That's, that's a lie. I'm still a gigantic nerd. What am I saying? <laughs> anyway... Uh, consequently, these things are largely concerned with switching. The earliest ones uh, just did it well, the same way the phone company did. It was literally uh, connecting pairs of copper wire together and then putting a power supply between them so that the, the speaker and the microphone in your, your handset uh, would operate. And that was it. But as time went on, they, of course, got far more sophisticated. This is from the second to last generation of PBXs, uh, basically. It's actually quite old, but they really just haven't changed all that much over time. Nowadays, they're pretty much all IP-based. So your phone is a computer, and the PBX is a computer, and the phone company exposes a computer to you. And you just have a computer sending a message to a computer, which forwards it to a computer, and you make a phone call that way. It's all very boring. It was my job for a long time, let me tell you. But this is from the in-between era. So you would install this at your place of business, and then everybody's desk would get a, a proprietary digital telephone set, which is, yeah, just a, a dedicated device that only works with this system. Looks like a phone, isn't really a phone. It's actually an integrated component of this particular PBX. It connects over what looks like a phone line, but it sends digital messages to this uh, machine instead of analog audio waveforms. But this era of PBX always has pretty much the same set of components, even though I've never seen this one before. Uh, this guy over here is gonna be your central processor card. That's probably what CPC stands for. If we pull this out, boy, howdy, look at that. Isn't that a bunch of chips? So this thing is basically a computer. Uh, in fact, uh, the heart of it is a Motorola cold fire. That's a uh, MCF 5272VF66. And I looked that up and it's a 68,000 based processor. So uh, yeah, this is a Macintosh that routes your phone calls, okay? Uh, and the other components on here are pretty typical computer components. We've got, um, uh, this is almost certainly ROM or flash memory. Uh, this is almost certainly RAM. I could have those backwards, but I doubt it. And then the rest of this is really just interface hardware for talking to the rest of the machine. You know, these are all buffer chips and whatnot for talking to this uh, great big bus interface on the back. I'll touch on that in a moment. Uh, there's some sort of Altera chip up here. That's probably an FPGA. It probably serves many functions. Uh, the only thing on here that's actually really specific to the telephone application is this chip down here. This is an analog devices DSP. I'm guessing the reason that that's on there is uh, for the music on hold. This is really the only time that the CPU card gets involved with the actual um, the actual handling of audio. Uh, obviously, if you put somebody on hold, you're going to want to pipe in, you know, a girl from Ipanema. So you plug your, um, your cassette deck, your radio or whatever into this, and that's going to get turned into a PCM audio stream. Uh, and then it's available on this card to any um, any other card that's interested in it. And that's sort of where we get into the general architecture of these things. 
I alluded that this CPU card isn't really involved in the, the telephone call process. They usually don't really do much with the call itself. They just orchestrate everything else. So um, the way the call begins its life is you start out with a line service card like this. Uh, let me just um, pop this apart. It's actually a really neat construction. They just have these uh, plastic standoffs with spring tabs on the ends. So you can just pull this thing right apart. Okay, whenever you see big honking nasty components like this, you know you're looking at something that's gonna touch the analog phone system. Uh, all those relays and whatnot are um, basically used to send 19th century signals down a copper phone line uh, to basically pick up the line, uh, hang the line up, or um, in some cases actually do pulse dialing. Like you could configure one of these PBXs if you live in a place with extremely outdated telco hardware, which actually did still exist when this thing was new. Uh, so that when you dial a two on your, your proprietary digital telephone set that has all the special functions like transfer and conference and all this 20th century shit, uh, it actually makes this relay go click, click, to send a two. And if you dial a nine, then it goes click, 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 to send nine pulses. Uh, very arcane stuff. Uh, you've also got your um, big honking capacitors and huge resistors. There's <laughs> there's fuses. And of course, I, I see the T nomenclature. So these are transformers. You can't forget those. This is all standard equipment for interfacing with uh, what they call plain old telephone service, uh, just, just copper telephone lines, the same sort of thing that you'd plug into, you know, an unpowered telephone set in your kitchen, right? Just, just a classic old phone line. You could tell from the repetition of the components that this can handle eight lines. So you'd, you'd order eight analog lines from your phone company, plug them in here, and then when somebody picks up one of their desk sets, uh, one of these relays just drops and uh, picks up dial tone and patches the two together. And of course, there has to be some conversion, right? Because uh, your desk set is a digital device. So somewhere on here is something that converts the PCM signals into actual you know, voltage wobbles. Um, I don't know what that would be. What I did want to point out though, is that this says copyright 1990. So keep that in mind. This, uh, this particular PBX goes back to at least 1990. I love this extremely serviceable design. If you uh, needed to replace a component on this thing, you don't even have to spin out any screws, you know? You just pop it open. There you go. So the other end of the call is terminated through this guy here. Uh, this is a DKSC16 Plus. That's probably a digital key service card, uh, 16 port enhanced edition. And uh, this is much simpler because uh, all this is really doing is sending digital signals instead of analog ones uh, down the lines inside your building, down to the digital sets on everyone's desks. So it still has uh, some little tiny transformers and uh, you know analog amplifier components, but that's only because it has to push a digital signal down um, a bunch of tiny copper wires uh, where you know degradation is a real problem. So it's got to uh, pump that signal up quite a bit to get it where it's going. The point is, this also takes your PCM audio stream once it's been converted from analog uh, and sends it down to your desk set and vice versa. And all this stuff docks into this mainframe enclosure. And if we look in the back here, we've got these uh, ports back here and you'll notice the, the slots are labeled just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then they've got sub numbers here for nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Now I would guess uh, the reason for that is if we take a look at the uh, side panel here, this comes off. So most likely if you wanted to expand this system to have more capacity, you could actually take this panel off and use a ribbon cable probably off of this, um, this connector back here uh, to join it to another one of these devices. There's a matching uh, connector on the other end here. So you could turn this into a uh, 15 slot machine and I'm guessing that the missing eight is probably the CPU card because uh, for some reason, uh, the connector for the CPU is just a, a little bit lower than the others. Yeah, I don't know what that gets them, but uh, yeah, the CPU has to go in that slot. Now in this era of PBX, usually what this bus is doing is it's carrying uh, TDM signals. I'm not gonna get into the whole history of that, but these cards basically place calls between each other. Each card has access to a set of audio channels and each one uh, contains just the frequency range of a single phone call uh, in both directions. So you get, what, what is it, four kilohertz of audio spectrum and um, both coming and going. The uh, idea here is when a call comes in on the line service card, the central processor card sees that call, 
It takes a look at who's calling and, and what number they dialed. Uh, and if it's going to say a particular extension internally, then they just uh, ring that extension on the uh, digital key service card or analog. You can get analog cards if you want to use uh, you know, cheap, traditional copper line telephones off your PBX. That's also possible. Uh, so the CBC figures out who it's going to, and uh, it patches an audio channel between these two cards. Uh, so you know the call came in on channel three here. And this guy tells this guy, hey, take channel three on the bus and connect it to extension, you know, five on your interface port here. Uh, and then that phone rings and rings. And if somebody picks up, then the two get patched together. And now you have your phone call. And most likely the CPC isn't really involved at that point until somebody presses a button, puts the call on hold, hangs up, etc. And it has to do the, the necessary supervision to, to end the call. Okay, why am I telling you all this? Well, what happens if the person at the extension doesn't pick up after three or four rings. Well, it's got to go to voicemail. And hence, we've got our EVMC, which is almost certainly electronic voicemail card. Voicemail is fascinating because people started getting answering machines at home all the way back in the, oh, geez, I think in the 40s. It's so when the earliest ones were made available. And they would just plug into your phone line and they would just wait for a certain number of rings and then pick up and have like a tape cassette, basically, that they would record the, uh, the call to. Very simplistic devices. By the uh, beginning of the 90s, I think most answering machines were just like one chip. But with PBXs, it's basically universal that the voicemail feature is the most sophisticated thing the machine can do. There is lots of functionality buried in voicemail. Often a voicemail card will be responsible for things other than just leaving messages. And in fact, this one seems to be, as I'll explain a little bit later. So long story short, they always end up being PCs and I'm not 100% sure why. I mean, hell, this is a Motorola 68000. I'm sure that this has the oomph to basically ingest a PCM audio signal and, and store it somewhere. But I think part of why they end up using PC hardware so frequently has to do with that storage, because if we pull this guy out, what's the first thing you notice? Yeah, hard drive. You open up any PBX, go through the cards, you find the one with the hard drive, you found the voicemail module. None of the other functions require mass storage, but voicemail does. You've got to save uh, long PCM waveforms, which, well, in those days, in like 1990, uh, took up enormous amounts of space, relatively speaking. And you've got to be able to play audio waveforms. So you, you got to be able to play people's voicemail greetings. And of course, those have to be recorded and stored somewhere as well. Now, it's not that you couldn't use any old microcontroller to talk to a hard drive, but... Well, I kind of figure that with a PC, you get a lot of functionality bundled in that's just very convenient. I mean, you already have an IDE interface, so you don't have to implement your own. And then, of course, you can base your software on a standard PC operating system, uh, which includes you know, very robust routines for talking to hard drives and, and dealing with file systems and, and doing file system checks and recovering from uh, disasters and whatnot. So you get a lot of stuff for free. So I strongly suspect that the hard drive is a lot of the reason that these are so universally PC based. And you can always tell too, because they, <laughs> well, you know, just in case you're not aware, if you see these colors on a device, that tells you that device was made after uh, 1997, I believe, because these colors were standardized in the PC 97 uh, specification, which, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my dates wrong. Okay, sorry. Uh, the formal name of this thing was the PC System Design Guide, and it was it was actually supposed to be the system for uh, standardizing the capabilities of a computer. They would create standardized categories: a basic PC, a workstation PC, an entertainment PC, and uh, you'd be able to go out and buy something that was certified as meeting these basic specifications. If there were ever like stickers on computers claiming that they met these specs, I never saw one, and I've never heard anyone mention it. But the thing that they introduced that really stuck around was uh, the color coding for particularly the keyboard and mouse connectors. And then I think, let's see, I think they added more. Here we go. PC99 added comprehensive color coding for ports and connectors. Uh, and that came out in uh, July of 1999. So if you look at any piece of hardware and you see the two DIN plugs with the purple and the... Um, is that turquoise? I think that's turquoise. That tells you automatically that that is a PC for sure and that it came out after 1998. And then if you see the other colors, particularly this uh, this magenta for the parallel port, then that tells you it came out after 1999. Likewise, we've got the sort of gold color over here that I think was standardized for the game port. 
But that's interesting. We'll we'll talk about that in a minute. At any rate, anytime you look at an old PBX, when you see the voicemail card, you'll recognize it because it's got all these ports on it. They always have this stuff here because making a PC headless is just, um, it's a really tough row to hoe. Like it's really hard to get them to run reliably when you have no access to do conventional maintenance. But what kind of PC exactly do we have here? You can see yeah, some recognizable parts, but it's pretty weird looking. And the reason is it's based around an SOC. Underneath this uh, heat sink here is an ST Microsystems uh, system on a chip. Now I took this off the first time that I shot this video. Uh, and it was just a comedy of errors. I lost these um, push pins and I had to find those again. I almost broke one. I did break the fan. There actually was a fan on here uh, and it was held on by these screws. You'll notice that they're, they're like wood screws because in the early days of actively cooled CPUs, they didn't actually make heat sinks that were designed to have fans mounted on them. Uh, except in a pinch. So what would happen is you'd get like a 40 millimeter fan like they had on here and you'd just screw a screw right into the heat sink fins. And this was common practice for years. Um, this sink here is simply not designed to have a fan installed. So the screw actually sort of spread apart the fins here. But the reason I took the fan off uh, is because as you can see, there's a bunch of nasty grease on here. I don't know how apparent that is, but this is not supposed to be that shiny. This thing was apparently in some sort of like restaurant environment or something, because when I got it, the entire top was coated in this disgusting film of like black grease. I had to sit here and scrub it and scrub it and scrub it. And I kept trying different solvents. And then I actually hit on a uh, um, Goo Gone, which I tend to shy away from because it has a tendency to melt plastics. But in this case, it cut through the stuff really, really, really fast. So I just kept coming up with paper towels that were just completely black from end to end. So I don't know where this was used. It seems kind of weird that it would have been in like a restaurant environment. This is a bit much PBX for that sort of application. There were smaller devices that didn't require active cooling and, and thus wouldn't have gotten choked out by, uh, by smoke. Uh, the fan here was uh, completely choked out. And in fact, the back of the CPC card had this big disgusting like burn mark looking thing on it that was just grease that the fan had thrown onto it. So super disgusting. Um, I had to scrub that off as well. But when it came to the fan itself, it was not spinning. So I tried taking it apart and fixing it, but um, yeah, no bueno. I completely disintegrated the fan and just threw it in the trash. But here's the thing. I've run this for probably like 20 or 30 hours with the fan jammed and all it did was get warm. So I suspect that um, if you're not in a super hot environment, like a restaurant kitchen, say, that this doesn't really need the fan. So yeah, I'm just gonna go without it. Anyway. The chip that's under there is a variant of the 486, and I think I've got, yeah, here we go. I got the uh, data sheet here. All right, this is the ST Microelectronics PC compatible embedded microprocessor, the STPC uh, something or other. I'll, I'll put the full part number on the screen there. Uh, but this is just like any other uh, SOC we have nowadays. It integrates pretty much everything that you need. So it's got the processor itself, which is a 66 megahertz uh, 486 class, I believe. It's got a built-in RAM controller. It's got a built-in video controller. Um, it actually, I think, produces analog video, I want to say, because it actually has a video scaler function and a uh, yeah CRT controller. So I think this actually directly produces VGA. Uh, it's got the PCI interface, uh, it's got an ISA interface, it has an IDE controller, interrupt controller, a timer. So the only stuff they had to add outboard was a clock source. You got your crystal here, um, you got your VRMs, obviously. And then up here, you've got your RAM. Uh, this is a 72-pin SIM memory. And something interesting about that is that it's actually labeled. It actually says that it's 8 megs of 72-pin EDO RAM. Now, why is that remarkable? PCs didn't originally take memory sticks. They took individual chips. But when they introduced sticks, uh, they had a problem, which is each individual one did not saturate the full bus width of the computers they were being used in. Um, the 30-pin SIMs that predated these were only 8 bits wide, I believe. And at the time they were introduced, CPUs expected 16 or 32-bit wide memory buses. So in order to uh, add any RAM to your machine, you had to put it in in pairs, or sometimes quads, like on the early uh, 386s, you could not add less than four sticks of memory at a time. Now, when we got to 72 pin SIMs, they expanded the width to um, 32 bits, I believe, 
But then once you got to the uh, the Pentium era, I think those chips started using a 64-bit bus, so you still had to put two sticks in. So I, I could have some of my dates or my, my numbers off there, but the, the point is, I have almost never seen 30 or 72 pin memory that actually had the size printed on it. And I think this must have been some of the earliest where the manufacturer went, you know what, we know what this is gonna get used in because this board is actually copyright 2000. The 486 class processor was just affordable and adequate for the job, but it means that they had to use memory that at this point must have been in the last days of its production cycle. Like I can't imagine they made 72 pin for a whole lot longer than that, assuming this wasn't new old stock to begin with. So anyway, these are the fairly normal PC components, uh, the CPU, all its support components, the RAM, the hard drive. But then we get down to uh, the other half of the board here and there's obviously some unusual stuff going on there. I mean, not entirely, actually. This guy here is your, your BIOS chip, I forgot about that. This is a Phoenix BIOS copyright 1998. And this down here is a 34 pin floppy interface. So nothing remarkable there either, but I will talk about that a bit later. But then we've got these guys, and those are obviously not <laughs> something you'd find on your typical 486. Uh, this is a DSP module, a Lucent CTP Vantage DSPM. I cannot tell you everything that these DSPs are used for. Um, there's a whole wide you know, array of things. They could be used for um, transcoding audio, for instance. Maybe the audio format that comes off the TDM bus isn't what this writes to the hard drive for some reason. Maybe it's just um, inconvenient. Maybe they're compressing it. I don't know. Um, so this might be converting audio formats. One thing I know these get used for frequently is detecting DTMF touch tones, because in order to do that, you have to basically um, uh, take a chunk of audio samples over like, you know, 10 or 20 milliseconds or something, uh, and then do like a fast Fourier transform to figure out which frequencies are present. And you can do that on the CPU, but having a 486 do that on uh, potentially eight or 16 audio channels simultaneously is asking a bit much. So this is basically doing what um, what NVENC on, on a GPU does nowadays, right? It's just offloading this one very specific task that would be a bit much for the processor to circuitry that's just much better optimized for that sort of calculation. And I think this can only do eight channels at once. It does say 40-08. And usually that's the way these work. Um, you can get another card and put it in here if you need to do more channels, but these are quite expensive. And usually you sort of figure, well, if I only have 16 phones total in this whole operation, then probably not more than you know five or six of them uh, are gonna be uh, going to voicemail at any given moment, right? So you can get by with just one card, but if you do start getting hammered or if you expand to a second chassis and you add you know five or six more of these cards and a bunch of you know PRI line cards, you can get dozens and dozens and dozens of calls simultaneously, then you might run out of capacity. And then you can shell out the probably like three or $400 to get another one of these cards and pop it in right there. That's really the only specialized component on this whole device. There is a Xilinx something or other down here. No idea what that does. That's gonna be an FPGA or a similar device. Uh, I don't have the chops to analyze those, but um, most likely it's just basically providing glue between the various components. Um, I did notice that uh, there's no floppy drive controller on here. Yeah, this actually does not list a floppy drive controller, just an IDE controller. So I would guess that this is probably being used for that purpose, um, and then just several other just sort of glue functions. Uh, this guy down here, this Winbond chip, is a dual UART, and I'm kind of surprised that they couldn't build that into the, the Xilinx. It's basically just running the, um, the serial ports here and here. And that's some um, most of the functionality on this thing. For the most part, it's just a very basic uh, 486 PC that's got one or potentially two unusual peripherals plugged into it. There really isn't a whole lot on here that differs from, you know, just sort of a crappy laptop of the era. But there are a couple things worth pointing out. Uh, for instance, this port here, the uh, PCM port, I pointed this out earlier. Here's the mystery with that. This is a, a DA15 plug, which is the same one that's used for the PC game port. And the purpose of this is a little unclear to me. For some reason, even though all these other cards can communicate over that big fat bus in the back that's got like a hundred plus pins in it, I guess there just isn't room enough for the CPC to talk to the voicemail card. So it gets its own dedicated serial interface right there. And then it gets a, um, a PCM channel through this little ribbon cable here. 
I have no idea why it needs that. I couldn't find an explanation of it. Maybe it's buried in the enormous manual somewhere, but I doubt it. You would think that if the CPC needs to talk to the voicemail controller and actually send audio, that it would just do it over a TDM channel. At least I would think that. Maybe nobody else would, <laughs> because I'm kind of talking Greek here. But um, if all these other things can communicate just fine, then why can't these two devices? I really don't know. And I thought to myself, okay, what if it is a game port? What if they're leveraging something about the, the game port functionality um, that makes a, a good audio interface and it's just sort of an opportunistic thing? But I couldn't really suss out any reason they would do that. Uh, the PC game port is not really oriented towards being a general purpose port. And while it does have analog to digital converters for the um, potentiometer inputs, they're very, very rudimentary and they're only for input, not output. So yeah, I don't know. It just doesn't seem likely. I think more likely this is just going into this Xilinx device and it's some proprietary interface, just something that they cooked up. Of course, then why did they use the PC97 or, or PC99 color scheme? Well, my guess is that they had settled on a 15 pin connector. And at the point when this was manufactured, almost all of those were in this gold color because they were being used on game ports. So they just bought what was cheap and it happened to be, to be that color. Total speculation, obviously. I just think that's fun to think about. Now, the last thing here that's interesting, well, almost the last thing, is the optional LAN port. Now, I don't know why this thing would have needed LAN functionality, but there's lots of possibilities. For instance, um, the ability to log in from a computer to a little web server and check your voicemail remotely, or to do maintenance tasks, to ask you know how much hard drive space is left, that sort of thing, uh, without having to come over and plug in a, a monitor and keyboard seems very desirable, but I guess at this point it was still a pretty spicy feature because they made it optional. And in fact, um, I believe I saw in the manual that they never did get this working. It was like a future add-on uh, that never really came to pass because it just said it was reserved and does not function. And that makes sense. You know, there's no ethernet controller on here that I can find. And so that begs the question, where would you add it? And the answer is this right here. That is a PC-104 bus interface. And probably a few people watching this have noticed these standoffs here and that guy and are sort of um, getting giddy about it because this is not something you see very often. Okay, so PC-104, boy howdy, what a subject. So PC-104 is uh, at this point quite an ancient standard, um, although it's been updated a few times, it goes back a long ways. And it's a specification for embedded PCs for industrial applications. If you want an x86 machine to control a CNC machine uh, or, I don't know, sensors at a dam, basically the theme of this whole series, right? Little Guys is about x86 computers being shoved into little boxes and put in dark corners to do things that we would typically think of doing with a microcontroller, right? PCs have gotten used for what Arduinos are, are now famous for since long before the Arduino existed, usually because they're doing more sophisticated stuff than a simple microcontroller can, but sometimes just because the people who designed the thing were more familiar with that hardware. In any case, all the benefits that I mentioned about PC hardware, getting the software stack, getting the hard drive interface, all that stuff come with the platform. And so there's lots of reasons to use it. The problem is PCs are usually pretty big. As we've seen in this series, there's a lot of contortions that have been made, literally, to try and make PCs smaller. It usually involves making some kind of custom board, but that's a lot of financial outlay. And then you've got to worry about how are you going to mount it? And what if you need to replace parts? Are you going to have to provide your own line of proprietary replacement parts? Ugh, miserable, miserable. What you want, ideally, is a standard form factor that's much smaller than this and much smaller than the typical ISA or, or PCI card cage approach. So the basic concept starts with this screw pattern, this outline and that connector. So I'll just go ahead and uh, take this guy apart. Boop. So this is the actual computer. This is an Intel i386EX, uh, which is an embedded version of the 386, uh, I think. I think that's 25 megahertz per the, the number there. Uh, this seems to be from 1991, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if this whole device is from 1991. Now there's not a lot on here. We basically have the CPU itself. Um, I think there's like one RAM chip. I think that's what this guy is. We've got a uh, real-time clock. I'm guessing that's what that is. 
Um, this is going to be your BIOS. Um, there's an add-on ROM slot here that's not populated. And then uh, AMD Mach 220. What does that do? Oh, interesting. That is a programmable logic device. Huh. So that's sort of like... um like a CPLD or, or an early FPGA sort of thing. So yeah, some, some custom component that does a special thing. The point is, this is nothing more than the absolute core components of a PC. And you'll notice there's no keyboard interface, there's no mouse, there's no VGA, absolutely nothing. You put in five volts here, ground there, and then you've got two serial ports. Oh, and I'm sorry, and a digital IO, like a GPIO header. And that's it, that's the whole machine, that's all it's capable of, and I have not even fired this thing up because I have no way to even prove that it's posting. So in order to do anything with this, you need to add slices to it. These are basically Raspberry Pi hats, right? This guy has this header here that plugs into the, um, the 104 interface, which is basically just 8-bit ISA. Now this card here is another serial interface. I think that is a pair of typical RS-232 ports and then these are RS-422, I believe. And then this is a parallel port. So that doesn't really help us. Um, <laughs> doesn't make this computer any more usable, but here's the thing. We, uh, we plug this in here, and then we could stack another card because it's got another port. So we could put a VGA card on here. We could put a sound card on here. We could put something with keyboard interfaces on here. We could put a USB card on here. Actually, you know what, this being ISA, I don't know that you can get an ISA USB card, but the point is you build up the kind of machine that you need and you don't include any parts that you don't need. So when you look at finished 104 machines, sometimes they're as big as this, and sometimes they're these great big towers with slice after slice after slice. Obviously I love this, right? Like computers should get bigger when you add more functionality to them because it's extremely funny. I would love to collect PC-104, but it's just too expensive. Um, the prices on eBay are outrageous. I haven't looked up these parts, but I wouldn't be surprised if they command at least $150 each. And anything newer, anything with um, even like a Pentium class processor on it goes up to like $400, $500. And they're still making these things. They've been upgraded quite a bit. Uh, for instance, this guy here is a Pentium 133 class machine, and it actually has a lot more built-in functionality. Uh, this is an, a standard IDE port. You just plug a hard drive in there. This is a standard floppy drive port. Um, these guys down here are, um, I believe, VGA. Uh, there's USB. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, of standard ports. This has basically a normal motherboard uh, worth of, of components on it. This is not SCSI, unfortunately. This is like a generic uh, GPIO interface but it does have an onboard uh, hard drive. That's a 128 meg flash drive, a disc on chip 2000. And then on the back, we've got a CF card slot. It has 32 megs of memory soldered directly onto it, which is pretty respectable. And if I had the right version, it would have a sodium slot there and you could actually add up to, um, I think um, 128 megs of memory. And then I believe these guys over here have your um, your keyboard ports and your, your mouse and whatnot. So um, this is obviously quite a bit more convenient and a lot more um, practical for hobbyist uh, sort of things. But I, I literally found this in the trash. And uh, if I'd gotten it on eBay, it would have been like six or $700. And it's still not all that useful. Uh, but the point is they keep making them. This is obviously quite a bit newer than the other one. And that's why it has a second row of pins up here. That is, I believe called PC 104 plus and that's 16-bit ISA. You know how the Sound Blaster had a short ISA connector and the Sound Blaster 16 had a long one? It's the same thing. You see how they're, they're compatible? They just added more pins. If you go newer, um, you get to some that support PCI and those add another chunk of pins down here. Uh, and then if you go even newer, you get to stuff that'll do PCI Express and M2 and whatnot. And those, I would guess, are well up into the uh, $2,000, $3,000. I don't know why they cost so much, You'd think this is something that AliExpress would have in just droves, but they don't. Um, or at least what's on there still costs a fortune. I don't know what makes it so special. But at any rate, our voicemail card here has a PC-104 interface on it. It's literally labeled that. It's got the standoffs and it's got the 16-bit uh, ISA interface. So if I were to uh, unplug this guy here, boop, we can just drop it on there. And as you can see, you could fit just about one slice on here because these are a standardized thickness. So um, this unfortunately wouldn't do me much good. I don't need additional serial or parallel ports on this machine. 
And while there are things out there like video cards, which would be very convenient for this for reasons we'll get into, uh, and sound cards, which would also be fun, but cost an unholy fortune if you can even find one. The truth is I just don't need to upgrade this at all. Uh, so I'm not gonna bother with any of that. But why is it there? Well, I have a theory. This might be where you put the network card. They may have had like a, you know, a 3Com 3C905 compatible, you know, ethernet card you could plug in here. And then I'm guessing that this little uh, four pin header here connects over to uh, the LAN port. Hell, can we prove that? Should be pretty easy if I'm right about this. Let's just uh, see if these pins connect to the hole. Oh, there's one. There's another one. And there's another one. Yep, I was right. I won. So yeah, that's um, PC-104 and <laughs> I think this is one of my most unreasonable requests yet because these things are so expensive. I'm guessing anybody out there who has one is is probably more likely to want to sell it on eBay than to send it to me. But hey, if you've got money to burn and one of these things sitting in a drawer, yeah, I'd love to have it. Boy, that sure was a lot of talking without turning the thing on, right? <laughs> well, as is so frequently the case, once you turn the thing on, it gets a lot less interesting. But um, eh, there's, there's still stuff to talk about. I'm still going to do things. I'm going to play Commander Keen in this video, all right? Before I fire this thing up, though, I did want to show you the power supply because it is quite the beast. Telco Gear often has uh, pretty big power supply requirements because, um, well, among other things, you're often supplying a talk battery to a whole bunch of analog telephones. If you were to fill this thing up with analog line service cards, you could have... Um, gosh, I don't know, probably like 30 to 60 phones hanging off this thing that all need a certain number of milliamps of continuous current to keep them functioning. Not to mention, you know, this PC, um, I determined that the SOC on here only draws five watts, but you add that up with the other components on there and the hard drive, and then whatever the CPC is doing, you know, and, and any other add-on cards they may have added, you could end up with a lot of current draw in a device like this. So not surprisingly, the power supply is quite big. This thing puts out 300 watts and it's broken up into nine amps of 24 volts and then 15 amps of five volts and then uh, one and a half at, uh, at minus five, but hey, who's counting? That's quite a lot of power. Although I don't know if the original supply for this chassis would have been that big because this thing was made in 1990 originally, but this power supply is copyright 2002. So they may have actually upgraded its output quite a bit when they started, you know, putting PCs in here and whatnot. But in any case, yeah, look at those capacitors. 200 volt, 1800 microfarad, Nippon Chemicon. I think that's the good shit, right? <laughs> One of the good shits. That is a lot of capacitor. That's just, damn, those are big. And the whole thing is just built big, built heavy, built tough. Got tons of uh, big fat transistors back there, more uh, big tall capacitors. Look at all that hot glue, just snotted all over the place, you know, cause high vibration environment, right? A restaurant. Somebody's gonna hit this thing with a broom pretty much on the daily. So everything gets tacked down. We got more hot glue there on this gigantic inductor. There is a massive transformer in there. Can't really see it, but it's got a huge danger sign on it, so that's probably doing high voltage. I don't know what this thing is here. It says T3, so that's a transformer, but uh, it only has one loop going through it, so that's probably a current sensing transformer, but it's a great big heavy wire. That's like at least 18 gauge going through there. I also love that um, we've got this whole array of huge transistors stuck to the uh, heat sink in here, and each one is held down with this little uh, custom clamp that's just an angled piece of steel, uh, with a piece of heat shrink shrunk over the end of it so that it doesn't uh, connect the tab on the back of the uh, transistor to the heat sink because those are usually electrically hot. So um, yeah, I'm not much of a, uh, a power supply design nerd, but I can still tell when something is built above the usual level of quality. Oh, I'm sorry, you know what? Before I do that, I did wanna show you one more interesting thing. So you'll recall I mentioned that there's uh, one of these um, double row headers at either end of the board, and I think that's so you can join these things together. And I would also guess that that's what this is for, because there's one of these headers at either end as well. And that's obviously the uh, power bus, because you've got uh, pins on there for uh, 24 volts and for five volts, but you also have one for 3.3 volts, which is odd because the power supply doesn't provide that. 
maybe this is related to the power supply being so much newer than the rest of the machine. Maybe in 1990, they spec'd it with a 3.3 volt rail. And then when they made this thing 12 years later, they realized that wasn't really useful and just lost it. Not sure, but at any rate, um, we're now ready to fire this thing up. And of course, um, the PC has no um, power input of its own. It just runs off the bus. So we're gonna have to fire up the whole PBX. But fortunately, there are no loud fans in here, especially because I broke the one off this guy. Oh, and I should mention, uh, technically we do have the whole PBX here, and I know that some people are going to be disappointed that I'm not going to even try to demonstrate any aspect of it. The thing is, though, I did. I looked into it. I spent um, quite a bit on it, actually, and it turns out that this particular machine is pretty hard to administer and configure. Uh, the company was really uh, tight-fisted with the software for it, and if you don't have the software, you really can't do anything. Um, this isn't like many PBXs where you can just get into it locally with a serial port. Um, I'll talk a little more about that later, but um, this thing is basically a pumpkin to me unless I go through a tremendous amount of effort uh, to make it useful, and I just didn't think it was worth it. In the end, all it's gonna do is place a phone call, okay? You're not missing much. Uh, and don't worry, because in the future, there will be other PBXs on this series, which will work. Like hell. This is a NEC, oh gosh, what's it called? A Uniserve 9100, something like that. Uh, this is another PBX, and it actually has two little guys in it. I think this guy and, and, and this one. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll be seeing him in the future. And there's a much better chance I'll be able to get this one working. So don't worry, there will be phones someday. However, I am gonna leave this plugged in because the LEDs on this card do fun things when it powers up. You'll, you'll see what I mean. Oh, you know what? There's one little thing I wanted to share with you before we get um, all, all the way to demoing this thing, and that's the floppy drive situation. So let me pull this back out for just one moment. Trust me, trust me, this is worth it. So, like I said, it's got a 34-pin uh, floppy drive interface on it, and then right next to that, it's got a header for powering the floppy drive. Uh, this is not uncommon for this sort of embedded application. They'll have a little uh, mini four-pin header there, uh, and you'll have to use a, a cable that's non-standard to connect it to the drive. Well, I didn't have that, and I needed to get a floppy drive plugged into this thing so I could mess with the software on it. So what I did is I got a drive and put a cable on it, and I was gonna power it from an external supply, the first problem I ran into, though, is that modern, modern floppy drive cables have a pin blocked. This one down here. This connector doesn't, so you can't actually plug this in unless you go in and clip off a pin. So what I did instead is I used the center connector in the cable, which works just fine. They're electrically equivalent because it's a ribbon cable. So that was inconvenient, but we plug it in here, and then we'll just get E new ATX power supply. Plug this bad boy in. All right, let's power up our drive before we power up our PC, as one does. Uh, why him go? Here's what I think is going on here. When you plug one of these drives in upside down, like when you get the orientation of either end of the cable wrong and, and power on your PC, this will often happen. And it's because, you know, a bunch of the, the conductors on the cable are joined together into a single common ground. And so when you get the cable upside down, the motor enable line gets grounded and that turns on the, uh, the motor. Uh, usually it's just an indicator you have it plugged in wrong, but I tried every possible configuration and it always did this. So at one point I realized What's probably going on is that there's a pull-down resistor on this board. So even though this cable's plugged in correctly, with the machine turned off, there is a resistor in there that connects the motor drive line to ground, and so it immediately turns on. And I figured, when I turn the computer on, I bet it's gonna pull that line high, and this will stop spinning. Well, would you look at that? I was right. A fun little bit of trivia. I've never run into this before, but I don't know that I've ever actually had to power a floppy drive externally before. So this is probably not terribly uncommon. Sorry for the further delays. Let us now fire this thing up. All right, cool. Nothing blew up. By the way, uh, remember what I said? It does fun things with the LEDs. Oh, it just stopped. Bummer. It's not all that common to see an embedded device that has a boot sequence that takes that long. That's fun. All right, so here we are on the stage of history. We got a pretty standard BIOS here, nothing uh, too spicy going on. One thing I will point out though, is that it has two devices for the IDE channel. Now, as you saw, this takes a laptop drive and those typically plug directly into a header. So does this one. And there's only one header. There is no second spot to plug anything in. But 
Every IDE controller that I know of supports two devices. And if there was another connector, you could certainly plug one in. And I would guess that it's possible to buy a ribbon cable that would plug in there and would let you connect the drive and like a CD-ROM, which would be very convenient um, for bootstrapping this thing. But as far as I can tell, Intertel never provided that. They did sell a floppy drive kit, but their advice for reloading the software, if the um, hard drive should die, for instance, was to buy a parallel port CD-ROM from Backpack and use that. And that's probably why there's a parallel port on the device. Uh, and in fact, the uh, software that was on here has the Backpack CD-ROM driver. So presumably that happened at some point. So I'm guessing they just didn't bother to turn this off. Although it would have been really uh, convenient if they had just put another connector on the board. They could have done that. Anyway, there's nothing too spicy in here. Um, given that this thing is from at least 2000 and possibly a little bit later, uh, it's not surprising that it's got the modern um, style of BIOS where you actually get the menu instead of just having to hit page up and page down a bunch. It is kind of weird to not see like USB uh, or anything in here, even though it does have LAN support. It's a 486. I don't think you could put USB on a 486. Um, so it's just really kind of anachronistic. Anyway, everything else, um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, oh, there's options in here for TV output because this system on a chip that they used has the ability to output um, just like composite, like NTSC video. Um, they didn't expose it, but it's there. If you wanted your PBX to connect to a TV, I guess you could mod it. And for what it's worth, the only uh, peripherals mentioned here are just the IDE, the floppy drive, the serial port, and the parallel port. So that 15-pin um, game port on there is definitely not attached to a sound card device um, or anything else that shows up in here. All right, anyway, let's go ahead and exit. Now, like I said, I actually do have the original software. I managed to, uh, to get a hold of that. It doesn't do a whole lot, but I will show you some other things that it could do. Oh, also the uh, main processor just shows up as an STPC-S. So as far as I can tell, they actually used like a unique IP core for this thing. It's not like an, an Intel CPU that's just been relabeled or anything. Oh, by the way, did I mention it runs OS2? Yeah, so uh, in the early days of embedded PC development, um, OS2 was very popular for, for several years. Uh, this looks like 1994, I guess that's when it was released. You know, Windows 95 wasn't out yet. Windows NT, I think, was barely out, and Windows 3 was just not at all ready for, for an industrial application like that. Linux, I don't think existed at all. Unix, <laughs> let's not talk about Unix. And there really weren't a lot of other options available for um, an embedded system, like a headless machine that just runs a process, or in this case, many processes. It boots up into OS 2's text mode, OS2 did support a GUI, had quite a nice one for its era, and they disabled it entirely. And this just runs in text because of course, why not, right? You're just gonna wanna see the, you know, the log output. So this makes sense and it reduces the load on the machine. But of course, it also means you can't really do anything with it, right? Because this is just gonna boot up into the software, launch all the um, concurrent tasks, which is one of the things that OS2 was uh, actually very good at before Windows was. And uh, then it just sits there. And in this case, it's actually just gonna sit there indefinitely because I think I corrupted the data on the hard drive just a little bit. It gets to a point where it tries to load um, tone tables. Like I think it's trying to program the DSP um, with the um, like DTMF and, and, and dial tone and, and whatnot. And it just hangs here forever. There are, however, a couple things I'd like to point out here. This mentions fax. And in fact, it mentions fax back. And this is one of those things that voicemail systems, I think, frequently got used for that goes way beyond just voicemail. As I've mentioned in previous videos, uh, for a while, the ability to send and receive faxes was a huge feature on the PC platform that most people have just forgotten because faxes are boring. But for a long time, it was a big, big deal. And in the 90s, and I think to an extent the late 80s, uh, it, was, it was just a huge variety of products were sold for this function. And voicemail processors are a great place to put fax functionality because you can do things like, um, you can you can host auto attendance off of these a lot of the time. So somebody calls in and it gives you the, you know, press one for this, press two for that sort of interface. Well, you can have a button that says, you know, press six to leave a fax. And then you get a lot of options for where that fax can go after that. It's um, sometimes possible to hook up a printer. You could have a printer plugged into the parallel port here. And when the fax is done, it just um, automatically prints it. The advantage being that it's buffered on the device. If you need to reprint it, or if you want to forward it, or if you don't want to print it because you know it's junk, um, then you've got those options. Also, sometimes you've got the option to have the fax processor place a call to an inside line. 
And when a fax machine picks up at your desk, it can uh, retransmit the fax as an analog tone um, as if it just came in for the first time. And you can sometimes do stuff like dial into your voicemail. It will say you have five faxes. You can say, OK, um, press five and then dial a number uh, that you want it to forward all those faxes to. And that could be your fax machine at home or, or um, at a hotel that you're at or all sorts of things. I'm making all of that up. I have not checked the manual. Maybe this can't do any of it, but it probably can because I've seen it all over the place. But then this fax back thing, that's interesting. Fax back is fascinating. This got used for a number of applications. Um, suppose it's 1990 and you need to make an insurance claim. So you need to fax them a form uh, with a whole bunch of info about an auto collision or whatever. Well, you need the form, right? You don't want to have to call somebody at the company and tell them, hey, can you fax me this form? You're gonna have to wait on hold for you know a long time and then hope they actually do it that day. So instead you could call, you know, AAA or whatever, press six at the phone tree, put in your fax number, hang up. And then a moment later, your fax machine gets a call and the system automatically picks a TIFF document out of its database and sends it to your fax machine. And then when you're done, you fax it back and Bam, it goes into an electronic mailbox, right? Beautiful system, perfect sphere, hanging in space. And these got a lot more sophisticated than that for a while. And I cannot remember who was operating this. I think several companies, I think Radio Shack had this. There were systems where, um, suppose you need a schematic for your TRS-80 computer. I believe there was a time when you could call Radio Shack and press five for the fax back system and then press one and enter your fax number and it would send you an index of every document that they had, you know, broken down into like categories, like a card catalog. And you'd go, okay, TRS-80 main motherboard schematic is 1268. You call them back, you enter that number, give them your fax number and bam, it faxes you the schematic for your device, all without human intervention. Absolutely remarkable stuff. And it was possible, well, it was possible by the late eighties. And I think it was common in the early 90s. I might have my years wrong. It doesn't matter. It existed. It was super cool. And the fact that this mentions it means they probably had a whole system for it. And that's super awesome. Unfortunately, however, um, I can't show you any more of that. I don't know anything about the system and I don't want to learn. This is the last you're going to see of what this thing is supposed to do. Let's see some things that it could do. First off, uh, let's just bail out of this process. OS2 works a lot like um, like DOS, like Windows. Uh, it boots up in text mode. It has a config.sys that contains info on what drivers to load and whatnot, although it's a lot more sophisticated than DOS. And then it has an autoexec.bat. Oh, right. <laughs> I forgot that when you break out of the voice processor process, for some reason, it reboots the machine like five, 10 seconds later. You know what? It's probably a watchdog. I just realized this. I'll bet once you uh, reach the software, it probably calls some command that turns the watchdog on. And then periodically as the software is running, it feeds the dog, you know, it triggers some, um, some interrupt. And if that interrupt runs out, then it reboots the machine so that nobody has to notice that the voicemail card isn't responding and go over and, and reboot it. Uh, for the moment though, we're gonna go ahead and uh, disable all of that. It's real OS2 hours, baby. Uh, so if you hit Alt F1 during boot on an OS2 machine, it takes you to their equivalent of the F8 menu in Windows. So we're gonna hit C to go to the command line. So there's that backpack CD-ROM driver. Uh, it's running check disk, which I think this specific chunk of code ended up getting rolled into Windows NT. I could be wrong about that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the NT check disk. Yeah, you can tell this is the exact same output as check disk, I think even nowadays. Anyway, so. Um, this is OS2 in text mode, which is a completely legitimate way to run the OS. Uh, but as it turns out, they didn't delete the GUI. They, they installed like a normal copy of OS2 and then just disabled the graphical interface. So all the stuff for it is still here. We just have to turn it back on. But first, uh, let's get rid of that startup command. Otherwise, we're going to have trouble with it. So startup.cmd is their equivalent of autoexec.bat. We'll rename that to startup.back. Let's edit the config.sys. Now, unlike DOS, where config.sys was usually like maybe this long for most people, maybe a little bit longer if you had some wild stuff like a, you know, like a CAD graphics card or, or something like that, or just a lot of devices installed, config.sys in OS2 is more like its registry. This contains um, basically all of the configuration for drivers. When you install like a graphics card, all it's really doing is stuffing a line into config.sys. So there's an awful lot of stuff in here. Page one, two, three, Four, awful lot of stuff. And the order that things are loaded is important. 
So if I were to just move some of these lines around, then stuff would just crash and the whole thing would explode. OS2 is incredibly fragile. I hate it to death. And it's part of why I'm re-recording this video because the first time around, I got just a little bit too spicy. Anyway, uh, the command that determines whether it's graphical or not is this prot shell. Um, if you pick uh, this t shell.exe, that drops you to text mode. If you pick PM shell, which is the uh, presentation manager, their name for uh, their GUI, then that gives you a graphical environment. So let's rem out this line and we'll bring that one back. And then I also need to restore the mouse driver. That's mouse.sys and pointdd.sys. I removed those because I thought they might be interfering with the uh, voice processor. Uh, so let's save that, exit, and then reboot. So you can see it loads up all these device drivers for all the, uh, the uh, proprietary hardware that's on that card. I'm guessing that most of these are actually stuff that lives inside of that FPGA. All right, welcome to the presentation manager. I love this little... Uh, clock mouse cursor beats the heck out of the um the generic x mouse cursor all right so when i got this thing it didn't have most of this stuff on here i have added some software because it was just kind of boring all we really had was just the command prompt the system setup stuff and i think the text editor and that was about it so i pulled over um some games and productivity software and whatnot from a, a normal copy of os2 this is what the basic shell looked like in those days this is warp 3 um, I actually kind of like OS 2 2.1, but 3.0 is still pretty good. 4 is ugly and bloated, and I don't like it very much. Let's not even talk about 4.5. There is a long story about the relationship between Microsoft and OS 2 that I don't want to get into, but basically, at this point in time, Microsoft's flagship Windows was 3.1, and it shared a tremendous amount of DNA, both design-wise and code-wise, with OS 2. So this works a little bit more like Windows 3 than it does Windows 95. For instance, there's nothing like a taskbar, right? We just sort of have Windows floating in a space. However, the big difference is you could put icons on the desktop. Uh, there are some really weird ergonomic differences that you, you wouldn't be prepared for if you've never used this. For instance, left-click, does not drag things, it only selects. In order to drag something, you have to right click it. And I actually think this is a good idea. This is one of the um, elements of OS2's GUI that I actually enjoy. Likewise, Windows don't actually have a close button. We have a maximize button and we have a minimize button. When you minimize them, they just sort of go to the shadow realm. Uh, unlike Windows 3, which minimizes things to the desktop, uh, this minimizes them to nowhere. You simply have to open the window list, identify it by the name, and then you can summon it back. So that's kind of awkward. Uh, in order to actually close the window, you have to double click the window icon, much like you did in, in Windows 3. But unlike Windows 3, there's a tremendous amount of stuff in the window menu. All this crap is, um, is necessary for interacting with folders. Um, there's a lot more context sensitive menu stuff in OS 2. It's, um, it's very complicated. For instance, suppose I go open up a hard drive. Let's go to drives. Let's go to the C drive. Okay, by default, we get this thing called tree view. And you'll notice there's folders here, but there's no files. If we want files, we have to look at this in details view. Or we have to look at it in icon view. Uh, the trouble is I can't find a way to change that mode within a given window. So we now have three windows open. And the only way to avoid that is to just open it correctly in the first place. So if we right click on this, we can open it in any of these three modes. So, you know, just um, this kind of weird stuff like that. Part of it's because the OS was old and, and GUIs were still being figured out. Part of it is just because it sucks. OS 2 does suck. I will never get off this hobby horse. Anyway, let's just um, run a couple of programs here. I should point out um, there's a lot of multimedia support in OS 2 that's fun, but uh, completely unavailable to us because we don't have sound, obviously, there's no sound card, and we don't have a graphics driver because there is none. The graphics core that's built into this uh, SOC does not have an OS2 driver available. In fact, it doesn't even have a name. Um, I ran HW info on this thing to try and identify the card, and it just comes up as VGA color. That's all I know. So usually you get around that by using something called Snap, the SciTech uh, snap display driver. It's a generic Visa driver, but it doesn't work with uh, any ISA graphics card according to the documentation. And indeed, if I install this and reboot, it just goes to a black screen and, and sits there. So I don't think I'll ever be able to get anything better than 640 by 480 at 16 colors. Uh, fortunately, however, that's fine for a lot of stuff. Uh, so for instance, we can go into games here. OS 2 came with better games than Windows 3 did. 
they've got a solitaire, of course, although they call it Klondike, which is the, you know, the more proper name uh, for the specific kind of solitaire that Windows Solitaire is, but I digress. And it's, um, well, you know, it's, it's a solitaire game. Okay, I'm pretty sure I painted myself into a corner here, but there's good news. We can simply cheat. Did the Windows version of Solitaire have a cheat option? I don't think it did. I think it might have had a hint option. Oh, <laughs> I forgot that we get the congratulations. But with cheating once. I wonder if I get more fireworks if I didn't cheat. Probably. Okay, in addition to Klondike Solitaire, we also get a Mahjong Solitaire. And of course, that is the uh, more correct name uh, for this type of game. It's also known as Shanghai, I believe. Um, but certainly, it is not Mahjong. That is a completely different game. One neat thing about these games is there's an option called autoplay, which will just uh, play the game for you. It's almost like a screensaver, you know? I probably would have loved this as a kid, just being able to watch the thing play because I was really bad at like analyzing games and figuring out how to actually play them. So um, I actually didn't know how to play Solitaire until about two years ago. And I don't think I was a whole lot better at uh, Shanghai. And then it also included a very interesting version of chess uh, that actually uses a three-dimensional board. And I actually mean that uh, we can angle the board any way we like. Again, you can uh, have the computer play itself. Also good because I still don't know how to play chess. This is particularly nice because I don't know if the computer is doing a good job and I don't care. So yeah, much better games than Windows had, in my opinion. I mean, this is no um, uh, Space Cadet Pinball, but that didn't exist yet either. Uh, the productivity section just has uh, the basic text editor and a remarkably sophisticated icon editor. I'm not really sure why they felt that this needed to come with the OS, but look at all these options. There's so much. I think that there is no graphics editor, like normal bitmap editor included with uh, OS 2. So this is the only thing you have, and it can only do images up to like 64 by 64. It's really funny. Now, I had wanted to put some other games on here, but there aren't really a whole lot that'll run on this machine because, um, well, for instance, um, let's fire up SimCity 2000 here. Yeah, since this is stuck in VGA mode, I don't have 256 colors and that kind of scratches most well-known PC games. For instance, the whole bit about, oh, Doom will run on anything. I have never found a copy of Doom that will run properly on OS 2. There are several that will try, but they all break in various ways. And in any case, none of them will run on Warp 3. I'd have to have 4, and I hate 4. I do, however, have Microsoft Word for OS 2, and it's actually a pretty nice version of it. Uh, this is from 1992, and it's got uh, most of the trimmings you could ask for. I mean, look at this. <laughs> it's making 640 by 480 look terrific. That's so crisp, although you can tell that CPU is uh, really chugging to keep up. Uh, I also got IBM Works, and I don't think this is related to Microsoft Works. I'm pretty sure it isn't, though I could be wrong. Uh, and this also works just fine on here. Uh, do I have any example spreadsheets? I don't think I do. Untitled.lad. <laughs> oh, no, there we go. Excellent. I mean, the text isn't rendering correctly, which is really funny because this is IBM's own program, and Microsoft seems to do a better job. Well... Actually, I guess that's not very surprising given their history. But uh, at any rate, yeah, you can see um, this is nothing terribly remarkable. It is a computer and it runs programs. This system happened to come with OS 2, but that's just because it was convenient. It is, after all, just a PC. It's it's a 486. It'll run anything a 486 will run. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more of that in a moment. One quick thing, though, before we go, this actually has a shutdown button. Now, uh, the concurrent version of Windows, Windows 3, did not have a shutdown option because, well, at that point in time, you shut down your computer by just hitting the power button. You can't do that with OS 2. It has background processes, services that didn't exist in uh, the equivalent Windows. So you do actually have to hit this uh, shutdown button. And then, uh, much like Windows 95 in the pre-ACPI era, it just goes to this prompt here. If this machine supported ACPI, it would shut off now. But notice that it says you can either turn off your computer or restart it by pressing Control-Alt-Delete. Let's actually do that. So you may know this, but Control-Alt-Delete is not 
really a magical key combo. Um, it's it's relatively arbitrary. It is not um, some sort of special combo that like reboots the computer at a low level. It's just something that your software can listen for. And by default, when you power up your computer, I believe there's a routine installed at that location that does happen to reset it. Now, operating systems like Windows 3 install an interrupt handler so that when you hit Control alt delete it pops up a little list that lets you uh, kill tasks. And if you hit it a couple more times, then the machine will reboot ungracefully. Well, OS2 does something uh, in between. If we hit Control alt delete it hooks it and reboots gracefully. That does not cause any problems. Unlike Windows, it doesn't have the, um, the pop-up task list, but it also does not require you to shut down before you reboot. There is no restart option in the GUI. There's only shut down and control alt delete. That is the correct way to reboot the computer. Actually, when you finish doing uh, a service pack, like patching the OS, it tells you, please reboot by pressing control alt delete now. So yeah, I just um, thought that was interesting. It's not remarkable at all from a um, computer science standpoint, uh, but it's very uncomfortable if you're not used to this operating system. Anyway, uh, we're powered down because I'm gonna swap hard drives. Now, I think I told this story earlier uh, in shooting, but I probably edited it out, so I'm going to tell it again. So this hard drive is a 44-pin uh, laptop-style IDE drive, and it plugs into the uh, standard um, board mount 44-pin connector. Here's the thing, though. You notice there's no, like, uh, there's no rails or anything to, to get this aligned correctly? Well, the hard drive itself has a missing pin in the middle here where my thumb is uh, to key it. They uh, didn't bother putting that key on this connector for God knows what reason. I don't even know where they found a connector without the key. That really sucks. And it means that conceivably you could, um, well, yeah, I, I got the hard drive one pin off. That's, that's the joke. That's the story. Do you see right there? You see that bottom pin there? You see how it looks a little odd? Do you see how there's not just one missing pin here, but two, and that one's a little melty. I've been swapping this hard drive back and forth between this thing and a USB to IDE adapter uh, in order to get software on it. And I've done this like 30, 40 times. It's really tedious and irritating. Um, but the second to last time that I did it, I plugged it in and I just got it one pin off. And I turned the machine on and um, it's, it's booting up, it's booting up. And there's this loud pop and I know what's happened. And I, I take a peek inside. There's a little uh, hard drive activity light you can't see uh, on the board here. And it's just glowing dimly. And I'm like, ah, shit. Because I'd spent several days getting this thing prepped for this video. And I'm like, well, guess there's no video now. But the machine was still running. So I'm like, well, okay. Let's I power it off. And I pull the hard drive out. And the pin just stays in the connector. It blew off the bottom of the board completely just just evaporated its connection to the PCB. Um, so I used a pair of pliers and yanked it out where it had melted its way into the connector, plugged the hard drive in the right way, and it worked. I mean, you just saw it. That was us running OS2, doing all that stuff with a hard drive that's missing that pin. So whatever that does, I guess we don't need it. Clip it off all your drives. It's bourgeois, actually. Nobody should have it. So anyway, now I'm very gun shy about plugging these drives in and I check carefully every time and then flip it around and make sure the screws line up. Okay, we're good. The reason that I'm swapping hard drives is to make a perhaps unnecessary point that this is just a PC. It'll run anything you put on it. Uh, and that OS2 was completely arbitrary. I gave you the reasons they probably picked it, but actually by the time this machine was made, I believe they had actually switched through uh, Windows NT4 and Windows 2000. And at this point, I think they actually offered a Linux option. Why they re-implemented their software four different times is anyone's guess. That doesn't really seem worth it, but uh, th they seem like they were a pretty weird company, to be honest. So in my case, I have equipped this with Windows 95, the OSR2 release, as you can see from the Microsoft Internet Explorer. Not that this will be exploring any internet since it has no network interface. Well, I mean, I, I guess it does have a serial port. I suppose I could plug in a modem. Now, I haven't installed any software on here because there really isn't that much to demo. Um, you know, it's Windows 95, it runs Windows software, and I can't run any like games or multimedia software or anything since this doesn't have any gaming or multimedia hardware whatsoever. Uh, there are just a couple things I wanted to point out though. Uh, one thing is that the processor shows up as a Cyrix instead. Now I looked this up and I learned that that is apparently uh, the manufacturer identifier that uh, Cyrix built into all their CPU cores, or at least some of them. I guess that was a, a jab at, um, what was it? Uh, Genuine Intel, I think is what uh, Intel put there. 
Uh, but that does raise an interesting point. Why is it a Cyrix? I thought this was an ST microsystems or microelectronics uh, CPU. Well, uh, what's been explained to me is that ST was actually doing like um, manufacturing or second sourcing, I think, for Cyrix. And so uh, while Cyrix went on to get acquired and absorbed into, I think it was VIA, uh, ST retained the license for their cores and continued to make chips using them. That's not something I can prove, but it, it seems um, pretty self-evident. But if we uh, pop over to device manager here, yeah, there's no um, no interesting hardware to look at or anything, you know, display adapter, <laughs> VGA. Now, a couple interesting things about that. One of my patrons actually did find a driver for this thing, um, I think for Windows 95. Um, I didn't bother installing it. I mean, what's it gonna do? It doesn't have 3D acceleration or anything like that. But unfortunately, they didn't have an OS2 driver. And I was really disappointed by that because a lot of graphics cards that came out uh, in this era, like well into the early 2000s, uh, still got OS2 drivers. So I was really hopeful that that would work out, but eh, no dice. But one interesting thing in here is if we take a peek under other devices, we have this. PCI early non-VGA device. And I have absolutely no idea what that represents. I mean, when I ran um, SciSoft Snap earlier uh, under OS2, it said that it had identified my graphics card as an ISA card, and that's why it wasn't going to work. But um, this kind of suggests that maybe that's not true, or maybe this identifies a device that's um, PCI, but not VGA, and that's all that Windows 95 knows. I have no idea. I've never seen this before. Hmm. I wonder if anybody else has. Oh, interesting. So other people are uh, reporting that they do see things that are definitely not video cards show up as a uh, PCI early non-VGA device. So I guess my second guess was correct. There must be something in Windows 95 that basically um, identifies any unknown PCI device as, look, I don't know what it is, but it's not a video card. Man, I, f I feel like I should send Raymond Chen an email. Maybe he knows. Now, that's everything I had intended to show you under Windows. I didn't have much else, but at the last second, I had this realization. I had mentioned earlier that I couldn't really do much with the PBX card because I don't have the admin software. Now, theoretically, you can jump in through the serial port and do some administration through there, depending on how it's configured. But I didn't really have a way to even test that because uh, it uses these funky RJ45 uh, serial interfaces and you've got to build a custom cable. They don't use like Cisco rollover pinout or just straight one to one, two to two pinout. So you got to build a custom cable for it. And I'm really bad at that. And I, just, I didn't want to spend all the time just to find out that it wouldn't work. Uh, but then I was looking at this thing and I realized, hey, you know what? This card here, is an ordinary PC that has the appropriate interface on it because that's how these two talk. So could I just fire up Hyperterminal and get into this thing? Well, not really. <laughs> it's pretty disappointing. Let's go fire up Hyperterminal. We'll just make a junk connection here and we're gonna connect to COM1 and we'll set this to uh, 9600 N81, the usual. All right, we're connected and no dice. Uh, when I send control C, I do get a new line. And I think that actually, I think that's coming back from the other end. Let's see. Yep. Yep. So we are actually connected, uh, but there's absolutely no, no local interface. And that's actually on purpose because the way they configure these things, uh, you are expected to maintain them through one interface and no others. And apparently this one is set up for uh, LAN based admin. So the serial port is turned off once it finishes booting. Now, I actually did have some success getting into the management interface, but I only have the um, the backdoor password, which lets you change the IP address and like factory reset the thing and not much else. I can't actually do any work on it and I still don't have the software. So that was kind of a bummer. But uh, what I did discover is that uh, even in this mode, it will do something if we reboot it. So I'm just gonna pop this card out here and plug it back in. Oh, all right, so as we start up, we get uh, the card identifies itself as a cold fire. It identifies the four flash modules. I think that adds up to 16 megabytes. Uh, it detects the uh, CPLD. Um, I don't remember if uh, those are like FPGAs where you have to load the code at startup or if they have it saved internally, uh, but it's verifying that. It does a RAM test. Then it starts uh, decompressing, presumably from the flash to the RAM. Then we start testing all the uh, built-in hardware. Um, it's detecting the serial interface, the paging port, modem port. Uh, then it detects the uh, DSP board here. Uh, this is interesting. Active thread POSIX main. I don't know if this is running some sort of Unix or if they just have some limited um, like POSIX compatibility, but that's intriguing. 
Uh, I don't know what LSC board with daughter is. Oh, here we go. It looks like that's the um, uh, digital key system card. Okay, and then there we go. It drops into SMDR mode. And then once it finishes booting, it drops into SMDR mode, which I think is what it was in before when I was trying to talk to it. Um, since this is not configured for RS-232 administration, I think it just goes into basically logging mode as soon as it finishes booting, and this is all it'll ever do. Uh, so you can see the headers here for the SMDR records. Uh, basically, every time somebody places a call, this is going to spit out a line that says what type of call it was, uh, who placed it, which trunk it used, what number they dialed, when it started, how long it lasted. And then the, um, the cost here, that's probably not dollars and cents. That's probably uh, the cost of the trunk that was used, um, which complicated PBX stuff has to do with um, multiple priority routes to the same destination. And then the account code, that probably is literal because uh, in a large organization with uh, a lot of users, you can actually do stuff like uh, block long distance dialing by default. But if you enter an account code before you dial, it'll let it through, but then it logs who did it. So at the end of the month uh, in a large org, you can actually get basically a bill to your department uh, saying, hey, you know, engineering made $450 of long distance calls last month. Um, so you've got to take that out of your local budget, right? So I think you would actually hook this up to a serial printer and it would just sit in a back room. And every time somebody places a call, you get a hard copy of it. So yeah, um, not terribly useful. I'm really sad that this didn't end up having an admin interface because I love the idea of using the voicemail card as the admin console for the machine, especially because you could put a couple in there. So you could have one that is the actual voicemail card and then a second one uh, that just has like this, a copy of Windows that you're just using as um, a place to host the admin software. I think that's a cool idea, but um, doesn't look like it was terribly practical. So that is genuinely everything I want to show you in Windows. However, we still have DOS to consider. This being a DOS machine with VGA graphics, we of course can run some games on here. Now, unfortunately, um, it seems kind of pointless, right? Because we don't have sound. And what's a DOS video game without sound? And I mean, I'm not really joshing, right? Like this was an era of amazing music and games. Jazz, Jackrabbit, Duke Nukem 3D, One Must Fall 2097, uh, the Commander Keens, absolutely fantastic banging soundtracks, uh, none of which we'll be able to hear on this computer. Now, uh, there is a, a one thing I tried that I was really hopeful for. It's called VSB, Virtual Sound Blaster, and that's actually supposed to emulate a sound blaster uh, in software, and it can pipe the audio out to a Kovox speech thing, which hangs off the parallel port. Unfortunately, I don't have one, but it does have a mode where it can instead uh, try and pipe it out to the PC speaker as a, like a one-bit DAC. And that's supposedly functional, but not on this machine. If I run this and then try and launch any of these games, uh, the machine just hangs or, or spits out bizarre errors. I'm guessing it's some sort of compatibility issue with the SOC, uh, since it probably is not exactly equivalent to a, a genuine 486 machine. But as I threatened earlier, we're going to play Commander Keen on here nonetheless. Now, I had made a quip uh, earlier when shooting this video uh, where I said that, um, unsurprisingly, this game works fine on here because it has VGA support. But I had to think about it. It actually is kind of surprising because a lot of later VGA devices started to do uh, weird things with their support for the older modes. This is actually running in uh, the EGA graphics modes. Although, intriguingly, I have never been able to get Commander Keen to work correctly on a genuine EGA card. It always has bugs with the scrolling um, because it wasn't developed on EGA machines. It was developed on VGA machines running in EGA mode. And likewise, I've come across a number of uh, embedded graphics cards that theoretically support all the, the old modes, but when you try them, weird stuff happens. So it's fortunate that the, this one actually does it just fine. And of course, um, Commander Keen has the benefit of actually being old enough to support PC speaker sound effects. Um, you know, they're not the best, and the game is definitely much lesser for not having the ad-lib soundtrack, but what can you do? It's still playable. The same can't be said so much for Duke Nukem 3D. And you can pretty much tell right off the bat that it's not going to go well, because it actually takes like a solid 30 seconds just to load the game scripts. I don't know that I have ever seen this take measurable time. I mean, it's a text file. It's been like a minute. You know, maybe it's not uh, the time it takes to copy it off the drive, but the time it takes to like compile it. I don't know. At any rate though, uh, it looks fine enough when you get to the menu, but once you actually start the game, ooh, oh boy. 
yeah, this game uh, was really not made for 486s. It'll theoretically run on one, but um, at least in the DX2 class machines, which is what this is, uh, it just, um, yeah, it, it doesn't do great. 46s came at a lot of different speeds, and uh, if you had, I think, a DX4, this might actually have run acceptably. I'm not sure. There's um, there's very little floating point code in this game, but there is a little bit for sloped surfaces, which, as I understand it, um, the Pentium machines handled fine because they had FPUs, but generally speaking, a lot of 486 machines didn't and would absolutely choke on those scenes. You know, let's see if we can find one. You know, I'm not sure. I had read that uh, sloped surfaces would bring uh, this era of machine to, to its knees, but this seems to be doing all right. I don't really see a difference in speed between here and there. So yeah, maybe this has the FPU. Uh, I wonder if that was in the data sheet. I just didn't notice it. Oh, huh, would you look at that? Parallel processing integral floating point unit. I mean, given how late this was made, it'd be pretty silly for them not to include that. I'm sure it was pretty much free at this point. Now, I think this game has a detail setting, much like Doom did. Okay, yeah, it does, but I'm betting that it's not really gonna make much difference. Yeah, I suspect that the things that make this chug on a 46 are don't actually have that much to do with the rendering burden uh, and more to do with the underlying like game code and calculating visibility and stuff like that. There's an awful lot of trigonometry going on in this game just to just to make the world work. There is, after all, a reason that 3D games didn't pop off that hard until the Pentium era. Uh, to wit, I do actually have Quake on here. I wasn't even going to try it initially, but I figured, ah, uh, you deserve to know. Uh, Quake on a 486 is not a great experience. Honestly, the most intriguing thing about it is how well it does run. I mean, the frame rate much of the time is absolutely horrifying, but other times it's it's actually kind of on par with Duke Nukem 3D. It's not all that bad. This, I think, is just a testament to John Carmack's optimizations, but um, yeah, it still really uh, does not want to be on a 486. <laughs> but of course, the two-dimensional games of the era still run like a dream. The trouble is, again, man, what is the point of even playing something like Jazz Jackrabbit if you're not going to have the music? Oh, and in fact, oh no, I, I wasn't expecting any sound effects at all uh, when I fired this up. I figured um, that they were part and parcel with the music, but no, they made an attempt. Oh, that's awful. I mean, I can't blame them for trying. You gotta, you gotta do something, but ooh, this is criminal. Really, like, if you were going to play this game, you just needed a sound card. I'm trying to imagine the person who was forced to play this game without a sound card, and this was the experience that they had. If that was you, I'm so sorry that somebody did that to you. Like, it looks beautiful, and maybe if you didn't know what you were missing, you wouldn't realize how much atmosphere depended on the music and sound effects. But I kind of suspect that nobody was fooled. Look how they've massacred my boy! Now, something I found kind of fascinating is that while this does struggle with like the uh, the pseudo 3D texture mapped games, uh, I fired up Alone in the Dark and it actually did surprisingly well with actual polygons. Like, I think we're getting the full 30 FPS, 35 FPS, whatever it is right now. And to be fair, they're flat shaded polygons. They're not even like gross shaded. There aren't a whole lot of polygons on the screen here, right? But still, it's weird to see something like uh, Duke Nukem 3D just absolutely struggling and then see incredibly smooth polygonal graphics coming out of the exact same machine. Like it makes sense, but it's still weird. So obviously this machine was not intended as <laughs> a game system, but all the same, it, it's always kind of a bummer to have something that, um, that does great on the graphics and everything, uh, but doesn't have any audio and can't get any audio. It happens so often with older laptops, right? Because a lot of the, um, the 3A6 and 4A6 machines didn't come with sound cards. They would be fantastic machines for retro gaming and whatnot, if only. Not that I think you should do your retro gaming on a PBX, but hey, you know, you could. Now, there is a design for a PC-104 sound card uh, floating around on the internet, which I could build myself, and maybe at some point I'll do that. Uh, however, for the moment, let's just do what we can with what we got. It's not great, but you gotta admit, it would have been better than nothing.
Okay, perhaps that wasn't better than nothing. I gotta give it to him. Uh, compared to like Mega Man DOS, this is a surprisingly capable and cromulent version of Castlevania. This isn't to say that it's good, and the, it's kind of criminal to do this to Castlevania's music, but at least it's recognizable as Castlevania's music. You gotta give it that. So at long last, that's everything I have to show you about this machine, except for one thing. You remember earlier I showed you those gigantic capacitors in the power supply? They weren't kidding. So that's that. Our first, and I think certainly not our last PBX that we'll be seeing uh, on this program. And uh, I'm sad that I couldn't make any of the, the PBX functionality go, uh, but don't worry, it'll happen someday. I'm sure that's what you were holding out for, right? Everybody here was so excited to see me place a phone call. But really, this does encapsulate the fascination of the little guy. This is an embedded system. You are never supposed to know that this is a PC. You're never supposed to interact with the copy of OS2 or NT or Linux that's on this. It's just supposed to start up, run one program, and then you're never supposed to, to see what it's doing. You're only supposed to talk to it over uh, serial or over the network, never directly. These are only here in case the machine breaks, you know, the hard drive dies and you need to reload it. I'm not sure how the Motorola Cold Fire compares to the 486 in terms of capabilities, in terms of uh, processing power, uh, how much memory it can address, um, what peripherals it can talk to and how fast and, and all that nonsense. You know, in a shootout between these two devices, I wouldn't be surprised if computationally they're on par. And it is sort of a, a kind of a broken record to say that at some point we started putting shockingly powerful computers in innocuous devices uh, to do fairly menial tasks. And boy, isn't that strange. Sure, but it's also been status quo for a very long time. But in the case of x86, of, of Wintel machines, I, I think what's remarkable about that is how much, how to put it, wasted power is always in these things. Indeed, this thing has a fully capable SVGA graphics controller on it and an FPU and all this other stuff that'll never be needed uh, for what it's doing. And it does have a vanilla PC BIOS and it does have unlimited expandability in theory, right? If I were to take all these other cards out and put this one over here, I could stack PC 104 modules up all the way over to the CPC. No, I don't need the CPC. I can pull that too. Get a, <laughs> two or three more in there. The PC's identity is rooted in its ability to expand and adapt to any conceivable task. And so it's very rare to see one that's actually been stripped down to its absolute essentials. And indeed, that's not what they did here. This can still become anything, do anything. And to wit, we can put any OS we like on here. I could put Qunix on here. I could put Red Hat 6 on here, right? If I could find the PC 104 network card, I could set up a web server on this thing and, and use it to host my website. If my hunch about why they went with the PC platform is correct, then they gave this machine all of that unlimited complexity, um, all in order to get a hard drive interface. I mean, it makes sense because costs had come down, but still, like I said, this is the crux of the little guy's concept. It's fascinating to see the computer we're familiar with in all of its glory and expandability and customizability stuffed into little boxes that pretend to just do one thing, but they don't. And the length of this video is testament, I think, to that complexity. So fortunately, it's over now. You're all free. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I had a great time making this, and I hope you had at least a good time watching it. I know a lot of that was pretty dry, but there were just so many different angles to look at that I just, well, they're not even tangents at that point, right? There were just many things to discuss because this is so many things at once. So thank you for sticking around. Uh, I'm glad you watched this, uh, whether you liked it or not. Um, hopefully you'll stick around in the future for other videos that maybe you'll like more. If you're new to my channel, consider subscribing. I'm doing these things all the time. I try to do them weekly, although <laughs> there'll be times when that doesn't happen at all. But at any rate, um, remember to turn on notifications uh, in case I, I am uploading irregularly. But if you really want to help me out, uh, then consider subscribing to my Patreon like these people are doing. Uh, this is my full-time job. This is all I do. And um, even though many of these devices are donations, I do often have to go buy them. I paid money for this one. And the only reason I could do that is because I have budget thanks to viewers like you. Of course, they're also paying for my groceries and my rent and gas in my car to go get the devices and things like that. So I'm incredibly grateful to everybody who's supporting me on there. Uh, thank you all so much. I couldn't do this without you and everybody else. Thanks for watching.